What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thine diseases. And so what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits? How, how can I pay him back? Maybe I can give all my goods, bestow all my goods to feed the poor. Maybe I can run a marathon race for Jesus. Or maybe I can start a bunch of orphanages. Maybe I can give my body to be burned. Right? What, what, can, I, what can I render unto the Lord? And you know how Paul talked about charity. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity... He goes on, if I give my body to be burned, have not charity. Lay down my life, but it's not for the gospel's sake and not out of charity. What does it profit me? What am I going to give unto the Lord for all of his benefits? And Christopher knows where I'm going. Probably everybody does. Well, I will take the cup of the Lord. I will take, I will take the cup of the Lord, and I will call upon his name. When I'm in trouble... When I need something, when I need help, I, I will call on the name of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I mean, I'll put the caveat on it. Uh, assuming you're doing it sincerely out of your heart in the spirit of truth and righteousness and repentance and godly sorrow, yeah, that's, that's why you call upon the name of the Lord. I will take the cup of, the, of salvation. Well, what kind of cup is this? Is it a nice cup? Is it a sweet cup? No, we know what kind of cup it is. It is a bitter cup. And that was the whole thing about Passover. You shall eat it with haste. Bitter herbs. Don't waste any time. Have, have your shoes, uh, have your feet girded. Or, or have your feet prepared, shod. Have your loins girded. This is how you eat the Passover. Christ is our... Passover who was sacrificed for us he was the sacrifice he suffered the captain of our salvation made perfect through sufferings you are made perfect through sufferings I am made perfect through sufferings we learn obedience by the things we suffer Paul confirms the souls of the disciples exhorts them through much tribulation and suffering we enter into the kingdom of God God closing out this age with a tremendous onslaught of an antichrist system in a new world order that will bring tribulation and suffering to cleanse and purify, chastise and make chaste and pure a bride that's ready for the return of the Lord. Can you circumvent it? Can you get around it? No, you can't even get around it. And you took look at the crosses and you know, you know how we've talked about the crosses, the three different crosses. You're in the flesh you will suffer. So let's resign ourselves to the fact that no matter what, let, we're going to suffer in this flesh. Now you can suffer in this flesh in vain. You can suffer in vain. You can suffer and turn bitter, the bitter old man. Right? And you can mock Christ, or you can be like the other thief who was humbled, knowing that he deserved what was coming upon him, didn't blame anybody else. Recognize the purity and innocence of that pure, holy sacrifice, Jesus Christ. And what did he do? He called upon the name of the Lord. And he was saved. And then, of course, then, if Christ, if we follow on to know the Lord and Christ comes forth in our flesh, then we can actually be, to a degree, the reenactment of Jesus Christ crucified to our generation. We can actually walk in the fellowship of his sufferings. And that's how we know Him, that I may know Him. The fellowship of His suffering and the power of His resurrection. You know how the cross goes. You know how, the, the, how everything, the law of God works. Before honor, humility. He was crucified in weakness. He's raised in power. Weakness, power. Humility, honor. Suffering, glorification. That's how it works. There's no back door. There's no circumventing it. 
So let's resign ourselves and renew the spirit of our minds. Let's suffer and make it worthwhile. Embrace, set our sight, our, our affection on, if I can say it like that, yeah, set our affection on things above. Set our focus and our determination to embrace this fellowship of sufferings, knowing what it, what it uh, will bring, which is a respect for the recompense of the reward. If you don't respect the reward, if you don't believe that God will glorify you and raise you from the dead and make you a partaker of His glory and His holiness, that is the strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy isn't here. The joy is set before you. Joy comes in the morning. Amen. The morning of the third day, Christ returning again. That's when the joy comes. And that hope that we believe, that hope that has substance to it, it's not just a description or a mental image. It actually has a substance in our heart. God bears witness, confirms the witness, and strengthens it through preaching, confirms it once again through experiences and personal visitations. And that joy of the Lord is our strength to endure the sufferings. Consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession. The apostle suffered. The high priest was glorified. And it came in that order. First the apostleship, the humility, the suffering of death, the reproach, the shame, the despisement, the rejection, the anguish, the struggle in the Garden of Gethsemane, culminating in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember we said this the other week. This, isn't a, this law of God isn't a program that, that uh, God says, okay, you're going to go through all this suffering and all this stuff's going to happen to you. And we say, oh, whippy-doo, sign me up. I can't wait to go. <laughs> because it just doesn't work like that. No. That's why he said to Peter, when you were young, you girded yourself. You know, when you were young, you were full of stuff and vinegar. And you, you had a big strong will and lots of ambition and you're going to go do things for the Lord or how people do that when they're young, younger. Uh, they have lots of strength, lots of energy, lots of resources, lots of ways that they can perform and act out and carry out what they think they want to do and all their ideas and their religious practices. <clears throat> they have the means to do it. They gird themselves. And, but Jesus says when you're old, somebody else is going to, care, going to gird you. Holy Ghost is going to gird you. The Holy Ghost is going to give you strength. And He's going to carry and bring you into a place you would not have gone. You, you would not go. And that's, that's, that's what we, we, we anticipate. That's what we anticipate. That the Holy Ghost is going to lead us. And, of course, because we're not willing to go, and that's kind of normal, that we, nobody wants to sign up whole hog and for the sufferings. However, as we develop and culture this respect for the reward, as we realize, you know, how depraved we are as sinners and what Christ saved us from, and we realize the, the scope and the magnitude of the benefits of God that should leave us eventually awestruck, that's all going to motivate us. What, what, can I, what can I repay the Lord? What can I repay Him? And David says it. Take this cup. Let be the focus of your life. Pick up your cross daily. Follow me. So, what shall I render unto the Lord? I will take the cup of the Lord and I will call upon His name. Now, there's a very simple pattern in the Scripture, and I like to focus a lot on certain um, issues, basic fundamental precepts of the Bible that are just so common to all, I know bitterness is one of them, and then baptism is another one. Because we're saved by faith uh, through uh, faith. We have faith in the operation of God. And the operation of God is basically how He baptizes us. And, and you know the Bible talks about in Hebrews leaving the, uh, leaving the first principles of the doctrine of Christ, of the laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment and of the doctrine of baptisms and it's plural and then where was it one of the epistles one lord one faith one baptism and the carnal mind sees a contradiction there well is it baptism or if it's baptisms 
The one baptism is the baptism of, of affliction that saves you. It's a baptism of affliction. That's what saves you. That's what saves me. As Peter said, uh, whereunto baptism doth also now save us. It's not just a putting off of the filth of the flesh, but it is experiencing the sufferings in your body, in your flesh, and not just any sufferings, but sufferings that God brings you into, that God oversees and ordains and works with you in those afflictions to bring godly sorrow, to bring instruction to the mind, the heart, the soul, and to write His law on the table of your heart with the Holy Ghost. Right? And we talked about the law of God, the two tables of stone which represent your heart. Right? And God wrote the Ten Commandments with His finger. It wasn't a handwriting of ordinances. It was a finger. The finger of God is the Holy Ghost. It represents the Holy Ghost individually writing on the tables of our hearts. And so that is a baptism. And that baptism is the baptism of affliction. And the baptism of affliction is a bitter thing. So as we talk about Christ and Antichrist and the law of God, and let's say the law of Antichrist, if you want to put it that way, the mystery of godliness, the mystery of iniquity, and all of these things, uh, the patterns are the same. The patterns are the same. And the tools that each spirit uses, Christ or Antichrist, are the same or similar tools. God tries to bring us into agreement and tries to bond us to His law of charity and to His operation of perfection. He, he tries to bond us to it uh, through uh, bringing, uh, uh, beginning with the fear of God. God tries to get us, move us with the fear of God. Noah was moved with fear. The devil tries to move you with ungodly fear. Fear is a commodity that both God and the devil tries to use. Knowledge is a commodity that both God and the devil try to use. There's the knowledge of God and there's the knowledge of this world. And, uh, and on it goes. And it's, such, it's the same with bitterness. It's the same thing with bitterness. There is a goal of bitterness, which is the bond of iniquity, as we all know. That is another fundamental thing. If we have a bond or a bondage to iniquity, if we have a bondage to the spirit of Antichrist, if we have a bondage or a stronghold to an unclean spirit, if we have any kind of bondage, you can mark it down. It's related and identified with some kind of bitterness. Because the goal of bitterness is what bonds you to the... Uh, to the desires of Satan, to the evil spirits. It bonds you to it. It brings you to agreement to it. How, do, how can we characterize it? Well, you know, if someone, if someone, uh, I don't know, <laughs> what's the name? If, if, if someone slanders you, if someone cheats on you, if someone betrays you, and that's a bitter thing to you, it, uh, something that's bitter, it's, it's disagreeable. It's acrid, it's acrimonious, it's uh, painful, it's stinging, it's disruptive, it's wounding, it's, it's, uh, it, it torments, it separates. And the bitterness is something, an experience or something that happens to you that is extremely difficult and extremely distasteful, very difficult to accept it, to admit it, or to bear it. Bitter is any kind of circumstance that's difficult to accept it or admit that it's happening even or to bear it. You have to bear it. It's bitterness. It's difficult. Another, uh, this is like a dictionary definition of bitter. Bitter, resulting from or expressive of severe grief, anguish, or disappointment. Now, on that level of bitterness, on that description of bitterness, if there's something that happened to you that results in a severe grieving, a severe anguish, or severe disappointment, I would say that in and of itself 
does not necessarily characterize the bitterness as good or evil yet. Because I, I describe a bitterness of the, of the wicked and a bitterness of the righteous. There's a bitterness of the wicked and there's a bitterness of the righteous. And the bitterness of the wicked degenerates into, you know, uh, the destruction of the soul, the separation of the soul. Anger, hatred, murder, malice, malignity, antagonism. Antagonism is one of the offshoot emotions that spring off of bitterness. Hatred is another one. Murder is another one. Anger is another one. Now, anger... Anger is something that God manifests as well. But but coming out of the gall of bitterness, then anger is akin, as we know, anger is akin to murder. Whosoever is angry at his brother without a cause. So we might say, yeah, well, I'm angry at my brother because I have a cause. And that may be. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's something that can happen. But even in that, you can still maintain uh, bitterness in an evil sense. Although there is a way, and that's what the Bible says, be ye angry and sin not. Be ye angry and sin not. You can be angry, but don't get, let it get to the point where it spoils your soul in a, a personal, how would you say it? A personal conflict and turmoil that results in vengeful hatred uh, and all of those kinds of things. And those kinds of emotions would motivate you to revile back when you're reviled. To try to take vengeance into your own hands. And transgress the law of God. Then, so you can be angry with your brother, conceivably, I'm saying it's possible, scripturally, to be angry with your brother in a righteous cause. But even then, you'd have to be so in such a way that you don't sin. You could still sin. All right. Uh, resentment, cynicism. Bitterness is intense, and bitterness is harsh, and bitterness is distasteful, and it's just uh, deep-seated hatred, ill will, ill will, malice, antagonism, bad blood, hostility, grudges, acrimony, malice. Marked by anguished resentfulness. All right, embittered, resentful. And we all, we all know that when I talk about bitterness, I usually correlate or add uh, the comment about resentment because um, a, bitter, a bitter heart will resent, and resent means to um, relive something, to relive live something. And if somebody offends you and you keep repeating the issue and keep repeating the issue and you keep reliving it and you keep reliving it, it's, it's the evident token of the abundance of your heart with the mouth speaking. It's the evident token that your heart is actually embracing the bitterness, holding it like it's something worth, like it has a value to it. So that if I hang on to this bitterness and hold the grudge, it somehow makes me feel justified to strike back. So if I strike back, I have to somehow manipulate my conscience, play some kind of weird mental game in my mind with some screwed up counsel so that my conscience somehow is is liberated to strike back. And that's how how it does it. You you did me wrong and therefore uh, I have the right to take vengeance. I have the right. This is how the gall of bitterness bonds you to the counsel of sin. Where sin would want you to react the wrong way. That's the essence of Passover we're trying to talk about, eating and drinking unworthily. It really means that if we take suffering and bitterness as a part of the cup of the Lord that He pours out to us, what's critical is our response to that, response to those circumstances. Okay, so if someone slanders me and I get mad at them, well, the other day someone slandered me and I said, well... Boy, I was blessed today, and I mean, and I'm not saying it like as an as a kind of a sarcastic thing. I'm just saying, wow, no, I, I should acknowledge I'm actually am blessed if someone actually slanders me, and I'm 
I'm totally clear that it's, a, a, and I know that it's a slander. I'm, I'm completely clear witness, right? And my conscience bears me witness in the Holy Ghost, and I know it is, then I can say that. I can say, boy, I got blessed today. Yeah. I say, and, that, and that other fella, boy, he's really kind of beaten the air. He must be desperate. The poor guy is really in a bad way there. You know, instead of getting angry and bitter, though, that's, your, that's our... That's our warfare. You know, keep your heart with all diligence. And what's the diligence? The diligence is to keep the, uh, the vision of this operation, the expectation of suffering as God deals it out to us for whatever reason, to cleanse us, to purge us, or to have fellowship with the sufferings and to respond in a righteous way. And the temptation to not respond the righteous way, we can combat it in the spirit of our minds, with wise counsel. <laughs> wise counsel, make your war. Take every thought captive. Make it obedient to the, to the law of Christ. So if someone slanders me, I get angry. I want to pick up the phone and give them a call and tell them what I think. I take that thought captive because that's not the law of Christ. Throw it into the background. Now, what does my Bible tell me? What does the Spirit of God, what does the Bible tell me that the Spirit agrees with the scripture that I should do. Well, the Bible says, Rejoice! Blessed are ye when... Okay, and even if I don't feel like I'm sincere about it, I will put myself into that motion of spirit of mind. I will, I will, I will do the warfare. And if you do that... The Spirit will help you and agree with you and support everything you do on this wise. He'll do it. So, there's a bitterness of the righteous and there's a bitterness of the wicked. Fear, bitterness, knowledge, hate, anger, jealousy, the all attributes of character and motions of spirit that are on both sides, both good and evil. So, of course, we're talking mostly about bitterness. Now, I had a scripture come to me today, and it's one that I got before, and I, I kind of like it because it's so simple, and it kind of summarizes the whole thing in one neat little scripture in Luke chapter 2, or one or two scriptures. So, um, there are reasons to pray. There are motives to pray, intents and motives, and uh, uh, what we're talking about, uh, the proper motivations for fasting we talked about last week. All right, And it's the same with any part of the godly exercise. There's a time to pray. Okay, I know pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing means, you know, be in the prayerful consciousness of God at all times. Everything that happens... You, you got a consciousness of God and seeing if you can see how God is, is in this or what God's doing by it. It's a constant 24-hour awareness of, of God. Uh, what, the, the wicked man uh, that despises the law of God, God is not in all his thoughts. All his thoughts. But there's, you know, there's a time to actually sit down and focus on prayer or have a prayer meeting and actually apply yourself to prayer with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, with your voice to actually get down on your knees and focus on prayer. There's a time for that. And, you know, people talk about praying. Do you pray in the heavens are brass? You know, your prayer doesn't seem to get through. And you can, you can, you can get that sense sometimes, that you're praying and there's just no sense of fulfillment like anything has been received. In the spiritual realm, you can tell when something's received and when something isn't. When it isn't, it bounces back to you. When you're preaching and the hearts are open, the Word of God goes out and uh, no, uh, no, no kickback, right? There's no, no, no brick wall, so it's absorbed, it's received. And you can tell. And then there's a liberty to preach more. But if there's not a... A receiving of it, it's like it bounces off the wall and kind of hit, and, and you get a sense of that thing. How do we used to say it? Oh, I felt like I was preaching out of a wet paper bag or something. It's like, couldn't get through to anything. But um, 
There is an order of operations. You remember in mathematics, you have order of operations. First you do the parentheses, the stuff in the brackets, then you do the multiplying and dividing, and then you do the addition and the subtraction in any equation. There is an order of operations. And this is very simple, but it's really neat. I thought it was really neat. So Luke chapter 2, and I'll relate it to baptism. So here's Jesus, our pattern. Sometimes our prayers are, uh, we pray and the heavens are like brass. Well, when are we praying? Why are we praying? For what intent or purpose? And I know men ought always to pray, so always pray. But sometimes praying, always praying, is so that you pray and realize your heavens is brass, so that you can examine and see why your heavens are brass. But regardless... Men ought always to pray and not to faint. So I'm not trying to discourage prayer. All right, I'm rambling here. Uh, Luke 3, 21, I guess, somewhere around there. Is that it? Yep. Now, when all the people were baptized, all the people, all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized, you see, Jesus was baptized in afflictions and sufferings. All right. It came to pass that Jesus also, one, being baptized, two, and praying, three, the heaven was opened. Pretty simple, right? So how do we get the heavens open? Here's the formula. It's an order of operations. Take the baptism. <laughs> Receive what God is pouring out. Take this cup of salvation. Walk in the afflictions. Don't be dismayed about them. Be armed in the spirit of your mind or have your feet shod with the preparation that this is of that this these afflictions come from God and are going to lead you to peace with God. Okay, so the order of operations is first you're baptized. And what happens when you're baptized? You are placed under a monumental amount of afflictions. Waters go over your soul. Baptism is totally submersed. More than you can handle. More than you can bear. More than your intellect can figure it out. More than your efforts can get yourself out of it. All of it teaching and inclining the heart to turn Total, holy to God, in a prayer, in a cry, in my affliction, I sought the Lord. Is any afflicted? Let him pray. Here's your order. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Now, you can offer voluntary humility, and I do it quite often, but what we're talking about is a kind of an overall... Uh, description of God's uh, operation upon us, which is a baptism, which is an affliction. So first you're afflicted, and then you pray, and then the heavens are open. And what does the affliction do? The affliction purifies your intent and focuses it entirely on God, which brings us right back to repentance, the purest form of wor wor worship. If peradventure, God may grant them repentance. If God grants you repentance, what's coming our way? Affliction. Tribulation. And what will it do? It will work in us a grief, an anguish, a godly sorrow, a coming to ourselves, a knowing of our own sore and our own grief. And you know, forgiveness has a prerequisite, whether you like it or not. In the dedication of the temple from Solomon, you know, when any man shall stretch forth his hand or all of Israel and, and look to you when they have sinned, when any man shall know his own sore and his own grief. You might say bitterness, an intensified suffering of anguish. See, here's the severe grief, anguish, or disappointment. That's bitterness. Can you be disappointed because you seemingly failed God? 
Well, and then the focus of your bitterness is not to an individual. It's not, you're not putting forth a finger. You're not blaming anybody. But you're bitter. You're bitter because you feel like you've missed out on God. You wanted to really please God, but you screwed it all up, or I screwed it all up. And you're bitter. How can I get back? How can I get back to this pure relationship with God? All right, well, that's, that's a good thing. So, you see how that works then. Jesus being baptized, prayed, and the heavens were open. You get into an affliction. In your distress, Psalm 107, right? The loving kindness of the Lord. In your distress, you cry upon the Lord, and the Lord delivers you. He hears from heaven. All right, Jesus was... Uh, afflicted with grief and agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he sweat great drops of blood and he prayed. He was baptized in the agony. It caused him to pray, Father, if, it, if this cup may, may pass, accept your will be done. And then what happened? Angels, come Angels came and, right. So there's your order of operation. So you can't do it the other way around successfully in the operation of God. You can't you can't, you know, you can't pray and then have the heavens opened and what, what have you. I mean, there is an order of operations is what I'm trying to say. And I mean, it's not, I'm not saying it as an utter absolute thing that you'll never get a visitation from God without an affliction because you will. I mean, there are blessings and there are things like that. But in terms of perfecting us and describing God's operation, this is his order of things. Baptized. Uh, bringing forth the righteous prayer, the righteous cry, and then the heavens are open. Well, you know Simon the sorcerer, on the side of uh, bitterness, and this is characteristic of um, religious spirits too, because even though bitterness is resentful and cynical, and these are parts of the uh, definitions of bitterness, uh, you would almost think it's characterized by some scowl on the face or some, you know, crossed brow or some person in total miser miserableness all day long. But it's not always characterized like that because Simon the sorcerer, when he saw that by the laying on of hands the Holy Ghost was given, I believe he was very earnest. And he came off like, oh, I want to help people get the Holy Ghost. Oh, let me give you money that on whomever I lay my hands. We know the actual motive was an idolat uh, idolatrous one. He, was, he wanted to be the great, one. the great one. And that's what Christians want to do a lot of the time. They, they want to jump into the high priesthood. Yeah. Remember we talked about to consider the apostle and high priest of our profession. Well, the apostle was the guy who was rejected, humiliated, despised, a man acquainted with griefs and sorrows. You want to identify with that, Jesus? Because that's what we have to do before we get identified with the other, you know, the glorified Jesus. What the high priest is a position of highly lifted up honor and glory. The high priesthood. That's why everybody wants to be a miracle worker. Everyone wants to roll around, lay hands on somebody else. And I'm the guy that prayed that got you healed. That's why the uh, disciples were got all... A, full of zeal and excitement. Wow, the devils are subject to us through thy, through thy name. And Jesus said, well, don't. I beheld Satan fall as lightning. So it's not all the miracle workers that you got all your faith healers and miracle workers going all out there. And they're all trying to identify their ministries with only the works of the high priesthood. And you tell me, well, guys with $20 million jets and a billion bucks in the bank and all this kind of stuff, you tell me what fellowship of the sufferings they have with Jesus Christ. See, they're missing the whole thing. God put them in slippery places. They are going to hell. Because the rich man cannot enter the kingdom of God. He cannot do it. It has nothing to do with money. Now, that's another message. But you see the point. People want to identify with the high priesthood because it, it, it's, they're sharing with a glorification. Christ was glorified to be made a high priest. He ascended as the high priest. And from the high priest comes all the gifts. 
but we also want to consider the apostle, Jesus Christ. So Simon the sorcerer probably looked very earnest and wanted the show or the demonstration of the Spirit, and he was willing to pay for it, and we know what Peter said. Your money perished with you, because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. For I perceive the dower and the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. All right, so let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking put away, be put away from you with all mal malice. Of course, the evil kind of bitterness. And we know, let's just read a few scriptures that we know about bitterness. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man, man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness bringing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of right sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. No respect for the recompense of the reward. Now that's bitterness on the uh, evil side. And I want to—I have a couple of examples here about bitterness that took place in the hearts of the righteous as God dealt with them. So I'll go through a few of those. Okay, we'll start with um, Isaiah 38 and Hezekiah. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and Isaiah. The prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord. Words. First, the affliction, sickness, with the threat of death. Then, a prophet confirmed, You shall die and not live, magnifying the anguish of that affliction. Then, the prayer, right? Yeah, he prays. The Lord, remember, I beseech you how I've walked before thee in truth with a perfect heart, done that which is good in thy sight. Hezekiah wept sore, then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go say to Hezekiah, thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears, and behold, I will add unto thy days fifteen years. And the heavens were opened. And I will deliver thee in this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, for I will defend this city, and this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he has spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees which has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz, ten degrees backwards, so the sun returned ten degrees by which degrees it was gone down. And then this, here's what I'm getting at here. The writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and was recovered of his sickness. I said, in the cutting off of my days, I shall go to the gates of the grave. I am deprived of the residue of my years. I said, I shall not see the Lord, even the Lord, in the land of the living. And I shall behold man no more with the inhabitants of the world. Do you see this bitterness? Do you see this affliction? Do you see this sentence of death? coming written upon him, coming up into his conscience, what is his anguish? What is his bitterness? What is the focus of it? What is the content of it? His bitterness is that, oh no, I shall not see the Lord. The heart of a king who had a heart that loved God and wanted to see and please the Lord and now... The threat of not seeing the Lord is upon him. His very desire as a king established by God. I shall behold no man. I shall not see the Lord, even the Lord in the land of the living. Well, that's not being ticked off and vengeful at your brother. You know, that's not being angry at your sister or your husband or your wife. And, uh, Trying to take vengeance on them? That's not the kind of bitterness we're talking about here. But it is bitter, isn't it? It's bitter. It's a whole different kind of bitterness. So mine age is departed and is removed from me as a shepherd's tent. I have cut off like a weaver my life. 
He will cut me off with pining sickness from day even to night wilt thou make an end of me. I reckon till morning that as a lion so will he break all my bones from day even to night wilt thou make an end of me. Not very good expectation, is it? You know, we'll go on to read about Jeremiah and lamentations. And in his affliction, his despair was, I'm cut off. How about Jonah in the belly of the whale? The Lord has cut me off. I shall not see the Lord. We'll, we'll read some of it, okay? This is the characteristic of the bitterness of the righteous. As God sends affliction to do a work in our hearts. So I reckon till morning that as a lion, so will he break all my bones. From day even to night wilt thou make an end of me. Like a crane or a swallow, so did I chatter. I did mourn as a dove. Mine eyes fail with looking upward. O oh Lord, I am oppressed. Undertake for me. I will call upon the, the name of the Lord. See, he's being afflicted and he's... What shall I say? He hath both spoken unto me and himself hath done it. God is doing this to me. God is doing this to me. You know, not a bunch of people out there who done me wrong and did this and that and betrayed me and depressed me and whatever. Right? Isn't that what the thief said? We're, we're getting our due for this. Doesn't God exact of us less than our iniquity deserves? Can we ever be of ourselves worthy of eternal life? We're, we're getting our due. We're getting our due. He ha what shall I say? He hath both spoken unto me and himself hath done it. I shall go softly all my years in the bitterness of my soul. What's the result of the affliction? Softly. Humility. Meekness. Anguish. Grief. Suffering about his seeming loss with his desire the Lord. Well, what is your desire today? What is my desire? One thing have I desired of the Lord. Well, what is my desire? Go and fix some toilets at hotels? No. Oh, oh, maybe go visit some porn sites? No. Go get a couple of good looking women and... What is your desire? What is our desire? And I'm not putting one against the other like fornication or sex above any of the others, but what is your desire? What's our desire? Well, I evaluate myself, and I see, I see things coming to pass in the Scripture. I might talk about them. If we get tangled up in the things pertaining to this life, desires of this life, if we get tangled up in them, then our best scenario is like the book of Judges, and Joshua told them, don't make leak with the... With the things of the world. Now, don't, don't go celebrate Christmas and Easter. Don't go uh, getting involved in worldly people. I can't, I, can't, I can't get too close an affinity to hotel people. I can't... You know, wh why? Because they will become snares. It'll become snares and they'll become thorns in your side. So now, personally, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll put myself on the line again, okay? This is how I see my own personal scenario. Sometimes I feel like I'm too uh, consumed in carnal work and things like that. On the other side, when I've questioned God about it, at, at certain times and to a certain degree, God would show how uh, Paul was a tent maker. He said, I worked night and day so I wouldn't be chargeable for you. Now, I'm no Apostle Paul, but while I'm just saying that, there is a legitimate thing that God would accept if I were, to a certain degree, go out and work, so I have something to give to them that have need, and then I would not be chargeable, if that's what's working in my spirit and in my heart, something like that conceivably could be acceptable to God, and then out of its degree, if I feel too compelled and obligated to them, and leave off what I should be doing for the church, then that's not good. They're becoming snares, thorns in my side, and pricks in my eyes, and choking out what God wants me to do, right? So, well, and then 
what happens is I'll come to an anguish. I'll wake up and start, I'll begin to become aware, begin to have my little epiphany moment or what have you, and realize and get sorrowful of, of how this has robbed me of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'll get bitter over it. I'll cry. It'll be a bitter thing. See, is it not an evil thing, an evil and a bitter thing, God says, that you've departed? Yeah, it's an evil and a bitter thing, and it ought to be for us if we departed from the living God. But now, see what the affliction does? The eye will go softly. Remember, affliction is going to purify your heart's inclination and intent towards God. That's what affliction is going to do if it does its job and if we respond to it correctly, if our hearts react right, if we get the re reply, the response, the fruit the, that God wants out of our heart, this is what will happen. Remember Joseph's brethren. What were they? Envious, vengeful, murderers, jealous, bitter. Put them in the pits. You're not going to... Re re rebellious. You're not going to rule over us. Who do you think you are with this vision of yours? Yeah. Right? So what happened when there began to be the mighty famine in the land? Same with the prodigal son. There began to be a mighty famine in the land, an affliction, suffering, anguish, affliction, hard times, bitter times, wearing them down, breaking it down, until... Finally, at the end of the story of Joseph, or coming uh, forward into the story of Joseph, Joseph's brothers come to uh, Egypt, and Joseph knows his brethren, but his brethren do not know Joseph yet. And Joseph begins to play the situation. You are spies to spy out the land you have come. You are spies, that's why you've come. And what did they say? We are. We be no spies, but we be true men. See? And I believe they were. Were they not in their integrity? Were they not in a desperate place of need because of the famine? Did it not kind of uh, supersede and overwhelm and override all the bitter and evil issues that they had towards Joseph? That, wasn't, that kind of stuff wasn't even operational in them at, the, at this time anymore. They were true men. You have to purify your intent towards God. What did it do to Hezekiah? I'll go softly. This is meekness. This is humility towards God. He hath both spoken unto me and himself done it. I should go softly all my years in the bitterness of my soul. O Lord, by these things men live. Well, I thought it was by millions of dollars and yeah. mansions and planes and God giving you a great life and everything's a success story. Well, I did a little job today. was a success story. I was glad for that. So you have your little successes if you want. But you see what I mean. It's not the pride of life. It's not a successful life. So how are we going to live before God? By these things. By these things. By afflictions. By humility. By calling on the name of the Lord. By the anguish of how we slipped and missed it with God. Because that's what our desire is. So we say, right? Yeah. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. That's where your desire is, ultimately. This is how men live. By these things, by these afflictions. All right. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. But I'll cast all my sins behind thy back. For the grave cannot praise thee, death cannot celebrate thee, they that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. Remember I was saying last week, the captive exile hastens that he may be loose, and that he would not die in the pit. The living, the living, he shall praise thee as I do this day. The father to the children shall make known thy truth. The Lord was ready to save me, therefore we will sing my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. For Isaiah had said, let them make a lump of figs, lay it for a plaster upon the boil, and he shall recover. The next example is um, 
I have here is uh, Jeremiah chapter 3. I am the man that hath seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. Now, this is really grievous. So I don't know if I've ever come to this depth or not. I maybe, yeah, all of that, yeah. He hath led me and brought me into darkness, not into light. Surely against me he has turned. He turned his hand against me all the day. He hath built it against me. Or my flesh and my skin hath made old. He hath broken my bones. He built it against me, compassed me with gall and travail. He hath set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. He hath hedged me about and I cannot get out. He hath made my chain heavy. Lots of oppression. Also when I cry and shout, he shutteth out my prayer. He hath enclosed my ways with hewn stone, and hath made my paths crooked. He was unto me as a bear lying in wait, and as a lion in secret places. He hath turned aside my ways, and pulled me in pieces, and made me desolate. He hath bent his bow, and sent me as a mark for the arrow. He hath caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins. I was a derision to all my people, and their song all the day. He hath filled me with bitterness, and made me drunken with wormwood. He hath also broken my teeth with gravel stones, covered me with ashes. And thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forgot prosperity. Well, how about that prosperity, preachers? Right? My, I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Remembering mine affliction, my misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul still hath them in remembrance and is humbled in me. Again, the effect of the affliction in this prophet, in this man of God, and for all of us, because we are all in the same common salvation, is humbleness, humility. And notice, none of these men ever have their hope completely wiped out. This I recall to mind, therefore have I hope. It's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning, great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in Him. The Lord is good. And to them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. He sitteth alone, keepeth silence, because he hath borne it upon him. He putteth his mouth in the dust, if so there may be hope. He giveth his cheek to them that smiteth him. He is filled with reproach, for the Lord will not cast off forever. Though he cause grief, he, yet he will have compassion unto the multitude according to the multitude of his mercies. For he doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. God is not some what's the word, malevolent, sadistic. sadistic, I'm going to afflict them because I want to see them suffer. No, nope. nope. God is doing this because it is the necessary, it is a, necess a necessity, a necessary element to right you know, Paul, what did Paul say? We had the sentence of death in ourselves. In ourselves. So we, we should not trust. trust in ourselves, but, but in the living God. That, this is the part of God's operation that affliction is accomplishing. It's putting the sentence of death, and these men are seeing the sentence of death. Remember uh, when we used to hear about how this definition of repentance is agreeing with God? Yeah. So then I characterized it this way. God said, I am sorry I, that I have ever made man. I am sorry that I have made man. Remember when God said that? Yeah. And then now we have Jeremiah and other prophets saying things like, Curse the day that I was born. Well, you see, there's an agreement there. God says, I am sorry I made man. And then the man in his affliction is saying, I am sorry that I was ever made. You see an agreement there? Yeah, yeah we're, getting close, we're getting to the place of repentance. That is describing the place of repentance. That's where it happens. That's where it happens, the uh, abhorring of yourself. The grief, the anguish of what we've missed. Of what God wanted or what we wanted from God in terms of a relationship, a blessing, a communion. And it's a grievous thing. And it's a bitter thing. And it's an afflicting thing. And it's a humbling thing. If we respond to it right. So you see that? Alright. He does not afflict 
willingly. This is something that's just necessary. God does it because he has to do it for this work to be done in our hearts, to put this sentence of death in us, and to kind of what, evoke a response out of the heart. From that place of humility, humbleness, anguish, brokenness, bitterness, it repents me that I've made man. I repent that I've been ever, ever made. There's an agreement. There is an agreement. And it's way down there, way down at the low place of your heart, the deepest place of your heart. To turn aside the right of a man before the face of the Most High, to subvert a man in his cause, the Lord approveth not. God doesn't approve of overthrowing your causes. It's just that he has to do it like this. By these things, Hezekiah said, men live. Thy loving kindness, the afflictions, thy loving kindness, you know, mount up to the heights, down to the depths, your soul is melted full of trouble, full of afflictions, then you call on the name of the Lord, and he hears you, and he delivers out of you all, the, all of your distresses. Whoso is wise and well observes all these things shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord, that loving kindness, that loving kindness, that pattern of affliction, that humbling of the soul, that bringing you down to the gates of death, that writing the sentence of death upon yourself is better than life. It's better than success. It's better than always being right. It's better than being popular. It's better than being a great preacher or a great prophet. Greater than, better than life. His loving kindness. God doesn't approve of subverting your cause. This is just a necessity. Well, why am I saying that? Because I'm, I, for one, I still get a little bit blind and feel like, you know, why, why all of this, you know? What's life about then? It'd be, be good for me if I would just just pack me up and put me under God, because what's the point? Sometimes I feel like that. You know, you can take issue with it and you want to say it's wrong, go ahead. I'll take, I'll take it. It probably is wrong. Then but wrong. then that's, but this is, I mean, I, and I, I have the other episodes of bitterness too, the, the evil bitternesses. But I have, I have a, a war going on. I have a Jacob and an Esau in this, in this, in this womb right here. There's a Jacob and an Esau, and they're struggling. The Esau wants to be bitter and mad at everybody in circumstances. The Jacob is the bitterness of the righteous. All right, and I've seen them both, and that's what God wants us to see. He wants us to see both, the blessing and the curse, the righteous and the unrighteous. We have to know good and evil if we're going to be made like God. You're going to have to see both. You have to taste both. Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, tasted death for every man. And that's how we're going to do this, by the grace of God. We're going to be girded and carried into this program, this operation, that we, normally we'd never, we, we wouldn't go. We wouldn't go. Uh, so, let us search and try our ways and turn again unto the Lord. Oh, this sounds like repentance, doesn't it? This sounds like repentance. Turn Try our ways, our deeds, our doings, our actions. Let's try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts with our hands unto God in the heavens. We have transgressed and rebelled. Thou hast not pardoned. Thou hast covered with anger and persecuted us. Thou hast slain. Thou hast not pitied. Thou hast covered thyself with a cloud that our prayers should not pass through. Thou hast made us as the offscoring and refuse in the midst of the people. All of our enemies have opened their mouth against us. Fear and snares come upon us, desolation and destruction. Mine eye runneth down with rivers of water for the destruction of the daughter of my people. Mine eye trickleth down and ceaseth, ceaseth not without any intermission. Till the Lord look down and behold from heaven, mine eye affecteth mine heart. Everything you see makes your heart cry. Remember what Christopher was saying, Passover, you are puffed up. You see sin and we're puffed up, but you have not rather mourned. So when your eye affects your heart, you mourn. Yeah. And you, you not only, you know, we can identify sin and it's, it's, it can be fair, fair game to identify sin in others. It can be if we do it with the right perspective and everything else. But 
when we identify sin, and that we also must identify with the sin. This is the essence of what we're talking about in Passover, one body. Discerning that we are one body. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. When one sins, somehow the body, how did this happen? You know, could the body have functioned in a way to prevent the sin or to deliver that brother? Or what, what happened? It's like we, we've all sinned. And, you know, the story of Achan, shall one man sin and the Lord be wroth with the whole congregation. That whole spirit of mind towards sin keeps us from getting puffed up. All right. Um, where am I? Yeah, my eye affecteth my heart. My enemies chase me sore. Like a bird without a cause. They've cut off my life in the dungeon. Cast the stone upon me. Waters float over my head. Baptism, waters, the waters go right over you. It's completely submersed. The actual water baptism, you're completely submersed in water. You're completely drowned out in afflictions beyond your own ability to make and correct or do anything of your own strength, will, power. And that is to teach the heart to call on the name of the Lord. But what does it make you feel like sometimes? They have caught off my life in the dungeon, cast a stone upon me. Waters float over my head. Then I said, I am cut off. Yeah. Now, like I say, I'm no prophet Jeremiah, but, and I didn't get exactly here, but I was relating to you things like questioning, am I cut off? I, I had the witness of the possibility of being cut off, and I had to wrestle with it. I had to encounter it. Whatever we're able to bear, God will help us bear it. I called upon thy name. You see, now, see, this can't be an ultimate thing. When, when Jer uh, Jeremiah says, I said I am cut off. Because he still has a desire and a hope working, so he calls on the name of the Lord. Even though he says he's cut off. Now, if I was cut off, why should I call on the name of the Lord? You would think. So even though he says I'm cut off, he still knows to call upon the name of the Lord. I call upon thy name, O Lord, out of the low dungeon. Thou hast heard my voice, hide not thine ear at my breathing at my cry. Thou drewest near in the day that I called upon thee. Thou saidst, fear not. He's remembering his former reign, his former days. Lord, thou hast pleaded the causes of my soul. Thou hast redeemed my life. Thou hast seen my wrong. Judge thou my cause. Thou hast seen all their vengeance, their imaginations against me. Thou hast heard their reproach, all their imaginations against me, the lips of those that rose up against me, and the device against me all the day. Behold, they're sitting down and they're rising up. I am their music. Render unto them a recompense, O Lord, according to the work of their hands. Give them sorrow of heart, thy curse unto them, persecute and destroy them, and anger from under the heavens of the Lord. All right, that's Jeremiah chapter 3. I am the man that has seen affliction. By the rod of his wrath. And now we have Jonah. And I'll try to pick and choose here, because there's a lot of content here. Well, you know, Jonah gets swallowed by the whale. He fled from the presence of the Lord. And the whale swallows Jonah. And Jonah, Jonah says, I cried by reason of mine affliction. There is the affliction again. I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I. And thou heardest my voice. If you really want to get to know the deep things of God, the hidden secrets, the mysteries, the deep things of God and intimacy. Uh, when Jesus went down to the lower parts of the earth, he went down, he, where did he have to go to get the keys? He had to go to hell. He went down to hell and he got the keys of death and hell and the grave and he came back with the keys. And the way the pattern, that pattern plays out in us is that we go into our little affliction, our own personal little hell. You think Jeremiah wasn't hell when he said, I'm cut off? But out of that, he got the keys to understanding um, what God is doing. And that, that's where we get all of our riches from God, is when we are exercised into that operation, get to that place. Out of the belly of hell I cried, and thou heardst my voice. Thou hast cast me into the deep, into the midst of the seas. 
The floods come past me about, all thy billows and thy waste passed over me. And here it is again. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. I am cut off. Yet I will look again to thy holy temple, still looking to the Lord. The waters can pass me about even to the soul. The depth flows me round about. The weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the bottom of the mountains. And my soul fainted. I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee into thine holy temple. See, afflicted, baptized, prayed, and the prayer came into the temple. The heavens were open. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee the voice of thanksgiving. I'll pay that. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And that's what he learned, first and foremost, in his heart. What did he learn in his affliction? He had nothing. He couldn't do anything. All he could do was call upon the name of the Lord, and the Lord heard him and saved him. What does he know? He knows salvation is of the Lord, not of him that runneth, nor of him that willeth, how does that go? But of God that showeth mercy. The race is not to the swift. The battle is not to the strong. And, yeah, and knowledge is not to what? To the wise? But time and chance happeneth to all men. Meaning, Circumstances, we don't believe in chance per se, but time and chance means things happen to you, circumstances from without, that you just you cannot predict. They're going to affect the accomplishment of the things that you are trying to accomplish. They're going to interfere with the way that you set your expectations and hopes because it's time and chance. You have no power over it. It's coming at you from without. It's too complex. It's too overwhelming. Circumstance, you can't control it. Time and chance happens to everybody. You can boast all day long. Uh, I'll, I will go into this city and I will make gain. I will go over here and have a successful ministry. I will do this. I will do that. You can make your boast all day long, but you don't know what's coming tomorrow. You have no idea. Salvation is of the Lord, which were born, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, nor of blood. You're born of God. You've not chosen me. I've chosen you. There. Okay, God's saying, good. Now Jonah knows that he knows that he knows that he knows. In the deepest place of his heart, salvation comes from me, the Lord, period. So that is so you don't trust in your own strength, so you don't trust in your own abilities, and so that your heart is wholly inclined to the Lord. And that's the essence of having no iniquity in the uh, eternal kingdom of God. There can't be iniquity. There can't be anything that ascribes um, righteousness or strength or ability or potential within themselves apart from God. That very concept in your mind, in your being, will eventually fall out to iniquity sooner or later. So this is a, a, an essential thing that has to be written on the table of our heart, and it's only accomplished this way. By these things, men live. By these things is how we're going to live. And then, if that, and then the Lord sp speaks to the fish and vomits Jonah, and he preaches to Nineveh and so on. And then you have uh, the story of Ruth and Naomi, and I'm not going to read it all. There's a couple other things I do want to read. But you know, call me no more Naomi. Call me... Mara, which is bitter, which is the same related word to the waters of Meribah, where the children of Israel strove. The waters were bitter, bitter waters. And remember the whole story there was the waters were so bitter that they couldn't drink them. And Moses cut down a tree, and when he cast the tree into the bitter waters, the bitter waters were made sweet. You know, the tree is Jesus was hung on a tree. The tree is the description of the cross, the sufferings. Our sufferings are bitter, but God throws in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Fellowship, a high priest who's suffering exactly just like we suffered, and his spirit comes down and bears witness and shines in our hearts 
and illuminates in our soul and manifests the kind of glory to us and, and we, we, everything that was bitter becomes sweet because it's our closeness and communion with Jesus Christ. That's Naomi. Call me not. Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty have dealt very prosper, prosperously with me. Gave me millions of dollars in a $20 million Learjet and Rolls Royces. And, uh, <laughs> no. The Lord hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi? Seeing the Lord hath testified against me. And the Almighty hath afflicted me. They, they know who's doing it. Hezekiah knew who was doing it. Lord, thou, and, and thou, Lord, hast done it. Thou hast both spoken, Lord, and hast done it. So, waters of Meribah, we talked about that. The tree, Moses throws in the tree. I don't need to read all that. Levi, who is a type of God's elect, has in some cases, as we've heard, let thy thumen and thy urim we with thy holy one, whom thou didst prove at Massa, and with whom thou didst strive at the waters of Meribah. Yeah, we enter into a strife with God. Don't think Job didn't strive with God. Pour out his bitter complaint against God. Couldn't figure it out. Challenged, almost challenged the integrity of God. We talked about this before. Uh, who else did that? Was uh, Jeremiah almost did that? Lord, you know. Uh, righteous art thou when I plead with thee, Jeremiah 12. But let me talk to you about your judgments. How come the way of the wicked prosper? That's challenging God almost. Yeah. He's saying, you know, I know you're a righteous judge, but the way of the wicked is prospering. Something doesn't add up here. What's, what's going on, God? Are you almost could be implying that he's not, his judgments aren't right. Well, we're challenged like that. We strive against God on issues. In the bitter experiences. All right, so um, that's the Levi. And uh, call upon me in the day of trouble on that Psalm 50. I'm not, I won't read it. You know, unto the righteous say, God says all these things, and call upon me in the day of trouble, and I and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. But unto the wicked God says, What hast thou to do to take my word and to declare my statutes? Seeing that thou hatest instruction, thou hast, con thou hast consentest with a thief, thou hast been a partaker with adulterers, thou sit and speakest and slander thine own mother's son. The mother is the church, the son is your brother or your sister. These things thou hast done, and I kept silence. God didn't even deal with it yet. Thou thoughtest thou was altogether such a one as, as yourself. Now, Consider this, ye that forget God, and lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. So that's, that's to the wicked. To the righteous, God says, call upon me in a day of trouble, and I will deliver thee. I remember I had a personal prophecy from a man of God when I was first saved and called, or among the first years or so when I was first saved or called. And I don't remember the whole issue of the prophecy except there was one lingering statement that kept <laughs> I remembered over and over again though many troubles beset thee over again round about over and over again though many troubles beset thee continuously round about I am with you to deliver you that's all I about I'll remember of the prophecy so Paul talks to Timothy about remember the prophecies that went on before thee but by them thou mightest fight a good Warfare. So I, I, I draw on those remembrances of those words to fight warfare. You have to draw on the experiences and words God has given you to encourage yourself, continue in the faith and in this operation of God. Of course, now we have Hannah. And I won't read it all here either. But you know about Hannah. Hannah gave birth to, to Samuel. And Hannah was uh, barren. And the Bible says that Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord, and Hannah was in bitterness of soul. Why? Because she was barren. She wasn't angry at people. She wasn't the evil kind of bitterness. She's barren. 
Well, I've gotten bitter because where is the Christ in me? When, when, when am I going to come forth? When, you know, when are we going to be gathered as a body? How long do we go about in this lame state where the whole church is in treacherousy, treachery and apostasy and where the dry bones cut off for our parts? How long? Yep. Well, bitterness of soul. She was in bitterness of soul, prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore, and she vowed a vow. O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look upon the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. All right, so there she is. She's bitterness. See, I'm talking about the righteous, the bitterness of the righteous. The bitterness of the righteous. And Ezekiel is the son of man. Sigh therefore, son of man, with the breaking of thy loins, and with bitterness sigh before their eyes. And of course, Job. We don't have time to go to Job. Job is so well known, I probably don't need to go there. I think the point's illustrated. But there's a scripture here I want to read a couple of them over here in the other sheet. Uh, but... But Job does make a statement. I'll read one or two. Therefore I will not refrain my mouth, Job says. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. And it goes on in verse 9, 18. He will not suffer me to take my breath, but filleth me with bitterness. And then here's a real good statement from Job that we can all come to eventually. My soul is weary of my life. I will leave my complaint upon myself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. Well, I think that's accomplishing something. We need to get tired of my life. I need to be, get tired of my life because it is preventing the life of Christ. It's, it's, it's part of sanctifying ourselves. If we sanctify ourselves to allow the life of Christ to be manifested in us, then we have to get tired of our life our own life, so that we will give it up. So, bitterness, in, in general, bitterness is a progression of things. It starts with disappointment, dismay, disillusionment, um, hope deferred makes the heart sick or bitter. And when a man perverteth his way, his heart fretteth, gets bitter against the Lord. In the plague of leprosy, they talked about certain kinds of leprosy. It is a fretting leprosy. It is fretting inward. It's producing a root of bitterness inward. Heart fretting against the Lord. This is what we don't want to, these are where we don't want to go with God. And so, uh, you know, hopes deferred. Well, maybe the hope wasn't set right. And I always advise with hopes, be careful how you exact your hopes. You don't want to be because if you're exacting them in your own uh, ideas, in your own applications, then of course the hopes rarely ever fall out exactly the way you, you hoping. And then when they don't, then your hope is deferred, and then your heart goes sick, then you're disappointed, and then you're disillusioned. And why? Why I thought that was a godly thing. I was set, how I was setting my hope, and maybe it was based on principles but maybe it didn't include other principles that were more influential in that circumstance. And you can go on down the line. So the hope of the righteous, delight thyself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Not the desire for things in this life, but delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desire to be righteous, the desire to be holy, the desire to commune with the Lord, the desire to pursue charity, the desire to love and, and serve your brother and your sister, to love, he'll give you the desire to love the brotherhood, he'll give you the desire, he'll give you the righteous desires that should be coming forth onto your heart. But if thou doest not well, sin lies in the door, and unto thee will be the things he wants, his desire, the things he wants you to desire, hatred, arrogance, lust, gluttony, or whatever everything he wants you to desire, he'll put those desires upon you because thou doest not well. Well, we can go into that too, and I'm not going to. Now, that's that. Order out of chaos, the new world order. God 
God does not command the light to shine out of light. God does not command the light to shine out of order and perfection in this life or through anything. God commands the light to shine out of darkness. You see these men of God, the waves when billows went over them, they were in darkness. They couldn't see. They couldn't see their hope. They almost almost gave up hope. I said I'm cut off. They were in darkness. God commands the light to shine out of darkness. And that is kind of the New World Order uh, ripoff of the ways of God. They're trying to bring order out of chaos, darkness, if you will. So baptism also saves us, not the putting forth of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a clear conscience towards God. So what baptism does is, okay, uh, I have been afflicted. I am the man who has seen affliction. God has testified against me. God has, you know, he's done all these things to me. And I know that uh, I, I've been baptized. I'm being judged. I'm receiving judgment. And once it is written upon our hearts what God wants written upon our hearts then we know that, that God has, we have come through the operation of God through this baptism. And when we come through, part of coming through is that your sins are forgiven and you have a clear conscience towards God. It's not simply just putting forth the misdeeds of the flesh if you don't go through this operation, this baptism, to get the essence of what God wants written on the table of your heart, that salvation is of the Lord. There's all of that stuff. Now, Psalm 89, I guess I'll finish with that. I have found David my servant. This is, Psalm 89 is dealing with the sure mercies of David, and the sure mercies of David have a lot to do with uh, predestination and the fact that God, I have not cho you have not chosen me, I have chosen you. If you're in Christ, if you're going to be saved, you're chosen in Him from the foundation of the womb, uh, from the foundation of the world, from your mother's womb. And God swears, okay, there's two things God swears. If you're the seed of Abraham, God could swear by no greater, so He swore by Himself, said to Abraham, Blessing, I will bless thee, and in multiplying, I will multiply thee. And I'm going to... You know, and implied is I'm going to save you. Remember last week we were talking about God hath given commandment to save. He's the ultimate authority. So if he's given commandment to save, then he's given commandment to save. But here's what can happen in the meantime. So he has uh, given, let's see, uh, All right. So the sure mercies of David. Right. I was talking about swearing with the children of, of, of the, heap, the, the children of Israel in the wilderness. He said, "To whom I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest." And that was it. Game over. Nobody went to the promised land that he said that to, <laughs> because he swore. Now God can think all kinds of things. And he can send prophets and says, Thus saith the Lord, thus will I do to you, da, 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 because you have forsaken me and I will do this to you. And the man can repent and God can say, Okay, oh well, he, he repented, so I will repent also of the evil that I thought to do to him. And all of that discourse of between God and man and wayward man, God never in that discourse swears. He is simply sending a prophet to speak the word of the Lord, revealing the current, uh, the current mindset of God, the current motion of spirit that's in God towards that individual as a warning. Because in his justice, he's going to warn, right? But he hasn't sworn yet. Even though it's the word of the Lord came to the prophet saying, now I'm going I'm to do this to you. And... But if God ever swears, this is the point. If God ever swears, that's it. It's over. That means it's gone out of his mouth and it cannot come back when he swears. 
So if you're in the, the seed of Abraham, and you're the very elect of God, and God calls you and says, I have chosen you. I have commanded your salvation. I am swearing, I'll swear by myself. Blessing, I'll bless you. Multiplying, I'll multiply you. Well, that's it. You can't reverse it now. Can you reverse it? He swore. Now, this is the power of God when He swears something. Completely irreversible. Both on the side of salvation and on the side of cursing. And so, keep that in mind in reference to the sure mercies of David. It's sure. I have a covenant with him, David said, ordered in all things and sure. So this is uh, Psalm 89. I have found David my servant, with my holy oil have I anointed him. With whom my hand shall be established, mine arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face, and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and my name, in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand also in the sea, and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. And I'll make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law, and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes, and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod, and their iniquity with stripes. There's a distinction there. Transgressions, the things you do in your flesh, transgressions, acts and deeds of sin, are visited with the rod. You will receive in yourself, in your own body. You'll receive a recompense. You will sow and you will reap. Transgression with the rod. He's going to rule them with a rod of iron. Iron is the, represents the flesh again. And he's going to visit the iniquity, the spiritual error, the error of the motions and embraces of things in your heart that aren't clean, that aren't right. The inward man, the inward, the iniquity. I'll visit their iniquity with stripes. That's reproach, shame, pain in the heart, anguish, all those things. What does God want from us? He wants a broken heart, right? Broken and a contrite heart thou wilt not despise. What did David say about reproach? Reproach hath broken my heart. You, you're hard-hearted and you're at liberty to sin left, right, and center and everything else. And you, you're supporting your conscience with false counsels and false applications and... Uh, multitude of excessive transgressions well you're going to reap not only in your flesh for your transgressions but god is going to visit your iniquity with all kinds of reproach and all kinds of things it's going to happen to any one of us that is the inward pain that is the pain inwardly okay it's the inner shame it's the inner guilt it's the reproach it's the godly sorrow it's the anguish it's the you know it's, it's the pain of the soul coming from all of that stuff. And a lot of people like to focus on the sufferings of Christ in the flesh. But remember what Isaiah said. Like, for instance, that movie, The Passion of the Christ, with, that Mel Gibson made. They kind of sensationalized all the sufferings in his flesh. And, and people like to get emotional and moved about all of that. And yet, for all of the suffering in the flesh... Yeah, Jesus wrestled with some of that stuff in the garden, but when he finally overcame and resigned himself to the will of God, he just said, said okay, let us go forth hence. He that is at hand that betrays me. Let, let's, let's do this. And he's just very, so sort of matter-of-factly submitted to it. Now, I'm not saying he didn't suffer physical pain, but the Bible says that God saw the travail of his soul and was satisfied. So it's not going to be enough for just... God to visit, you know, upon your flesh the things you did in your flesh that were wrong. It's got to go more than that. He's got to visit your iniquity with stripes. 
Stripes for the back of a fool, I think the proverb says, right? Stripes. And by the blueness of the wound, iniquity, or something like that. Yeah, blueness, the blueness of the wound, that is the stripe on your soul, the reproach, the shame. So, he talked about, um, in Malachi, about the Levites. He says, I'll, I'll spread dung on your faces. I'll make you a reproach. Yeah. He's trying to break the heart. He's trying to break the heart. No sense uh, blaming it on everybody else as though they're accusing you righteously. When God is bringing a hand of reproach, He's bringing stripes upon your soul to break your hardness. So, but nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Once, once have I sworn by my holiness that I would not lie unto David. There it is, the idea of swearing. You see that? He swore by his holiness to David. David is the type of Christ. Christ is who is the seed that's in us as the elect of God. All right. So he goes on and about that. Um, and notice if you'll read it, I'm not going to read it all, but um, he goes on to describe how God had cast them off and abhorred them and was wroth with his anointed. God voided the covenant and of, of his servant and he profaned his crown by casting it to the ground and broke down all his hedges so all the enemies started coming in. All that passed by spoil him. He's a reproach to his neighbors. There's the element of reproach. And set up the right hand of his adversaries. Turned the edge of the sword and made him not to stand in the battle. And so on and so on. You see, so there, there you go. I mean, God, it's like I used to say, uh, like I still say about um, the statement of Paul that all things are lawful. How people rest that. People like to say, well, in Christ, I'm not under the law and all things are lawful. But we just remember that in the days of ignorance before Christ came, it was not lawful for God to stir up all his wrath because light had not come. Men were in ignorance and they had no opportunity to be enlightened. So God winked at the ignorance. But now when Jesus Christ comes and he brings light, and he pronounces that he is now paving the way to justify the righteous judgment and wrath of God. Now is the prince of this world judged. Now is he cast out. Then after Christ ascends to heaven, Paul begins to preach in Romans. For the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold back the truth from being manifested in their bodies because of their unrighteous lifestyles. They prevent the righteousness of Christ from appearing in its fullness because of their pursuit of other ungodly desires. Right? God gave them up. Well, who did God give up? What did He give them up unto? God gave, what did God give them up unto? Vile affections. That's what characterizes the people that God gives up. One of the chief things. Well, anyway... Uh, there's one other little thing, I guess. Maybe I just... All right, I guess you see it. I guess that's... That would be about it. This is a... We have, we have to have faith in this operation of God. We have to be strengthened for it. We have to believe God and give us the grace to go through it. And uh, this is how we live. This is how we're saved. And... Like I say, we're not getting out of it, right? We're in flesh, so we can yeah. suffer wrongfully or we can suffer righteously. And it's it's kind of like we're, our backs are we're kind of pinned into the corner here. We're going to suffer anyway, right? So let's apply ourselves to suffer the right way so God can accomplish in our heart what needs to be done for us to be saved by these things men live. The bitterness of the righteous, the bitterness of the wicked. All right, God bless you.